I want to start at the core of human perception and interaction. The mind. Humans by nature are actually pattern seekers and tend to be resistant to change, especially when it doesn't align with their personal comforts or preferences. Yet what we sometimes fail to realize is that the key to creativity and innovation lies in this very shift. In music, it might be the repetitive melodies to get your feet tapping. In math, it might be the encouragement from a teacher to follow trends on a graph. But that pattern seeking and that homogeneity is what creates a magnetic attraction to the beauty of both of these fields. However, what transpires though when we reject the security of these well-known patterns? Well, to answer my question, I'm going to take it back one century. History demonstrates that when somebody dares to think differently or go against the conventional standard of their time, human abilities often advance to new heights. Let's take Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was actually shunned for his theories in relativity and for his theories in physics simply because he went against the conventional standard of his time. However, he still became a well-renowned physicist because of his drive and perspicaciousness to always discover change in the world around him, something that I 100% believe in. My experience as a pianist and as a math student has shown me how these two seemingly unrelated subjects can coexist together and how accepting irregularity can lead to groundbreaking discoveries and a greater comprehension of the world around us. To better convey this idea to you guys, why don't I play something for you on the piano? On the piano, in each octave, we have 12 notes. And if you listen carefully, each time I went up by one note, the frequency or the pitch also increased. But what I find really fascinating is that each time I go up a note, the frequency actually doesn't change by the same amount. So when I go from C to C sharp, it changes by some amount. And when I go from C sharp to D, it changes by even bigger of an amount. And the increment keeps getting bigger as I go up the scale. And this tells us something really important, that the relationship between successive notes on the piano in an octave is not constant, but rather a frequency multiplier. And we can actually derive this multiplier by means of mathematical graphing on the Cartesian plane. The first function that I'm going to graph is the function of y equals 12, because as I said, there's 12 notes in the octave. And the second one is log base r of 2. And it's not super important for you guys to understand what a logarithm is, but the significance of this function is by far the 2. And it's 2 because each time you go up an octave in the, on the piano, the frequency or the pitch doubles. So when I go from C to C, which is one octave, the frequency doubles. And from C to C again, it also doubles. And I can keep going. And the frequency will keep doubling and multiplying by 2. And when we see when these two functions intersect or when they cross, we can actually derive this multiplier, which is approximately 1.059, but I have it to 1.06 here. And this is actually pure mathematical proof that there is code embedded in our perception of what sounds good and also our perception of what sounds dissonant. Now, with that in mind, moving on to more of the music side of things here, the first thing that pops up into your head when you listen to a piece of music is the characteristics. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it jumpy? Is it smooth? Is it happy? Is it sad? And all of these characteristics are 100% defined by mathematical foundation. The speed of a piece is determined by how many notes pass, individual notes pass per second. So if I play something with many notes per second, inherently sound fast, but if I dial it back and play a low amount of notes per second, then it will sound slow. And another concept that I mentioned was if the piece was jumpy or smooth, and that actually doesn't is not determined by how long the note goes on for, but how much time passes in between the notes. And if I let a low amount of time pass in between the notes, then it will sound more calm and more smooth.
And another concept I want to introduce to you guys is the concept of a scale. And a scale on the piano is just eight notes within a given key that sound together. And to convey this idea to you guys in the best way possible, I'm going to take the simplest of scales on the piano, which is a C major with all white keys. As I said, eight notes on the piano within a given key that sound good together. And if you noticed, no one note really sounded out of the collective group or particularly odd or dissonant. And a lot of these modern musicians and these pop artists actually take advantage of this fact and apply it in their music to gain, a, gain attention and attract publicity because, as I said, humans are so attracted to patterns and, homogen and homogeneity. What I'm going to explain today, though, is how if I start to take these notes outside of the scale and start to defy the conventional standard, then you'll see that these new genres and these new playing styles start to emerge. If I take two notes outside of the scale, an E flat and an F sharp, I get a jazz scale, which is a very fundamental scale for the concept of jazz. The last concept I want to introduce to you guys is the concept of a time signature. And the time signature in music, in layman terms, dictates how many beats go by per measure within a given piece of music. And I, again, a lot of these modern musicians and these pop artists actually set this numeric to four to add to the regimented nature of their piece so that, again, it can attract attention and gain publicity because humans are so attracted to those patterns. If I change this numeric from four to three, then I get a waltz or a mazurka, which is a very common playing style in the Romantic period. One, two, three, 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 What I have shown today with the math and music is simply an analytical example of the innovation and creativity that emerges with the concept of change, something that's transforming our world every day. And my last message to all of you is to not be afraid to change and to not be afraid to be that odd one out. If all of these famous composers and famous musicians in the past didn't have the drive and ambition to go against the conventional standard of their time and change, we wouldn't have all these wonderful playing styles and beautiful playing styles that I've played for you today. Thank you so much.